We've covered the amplitude. Well, that's the easy part. It's easy to see the amplitude. Let's also look at the phase. So recall that we have this phase lag, delta S, uh, between the driving force and the response. Right? If we were to plot it, it would look something like this. As a function of drive frequency, if we were to plot delta S, it kind of goes like that. Inverse tangent of something with the omegas both in the numerator and the denominator, it looks like this. And it goes through uh, 90 degrees exactly at omega naught. So when you're really low, it's at zero degrees. This means that the drive and the response are exactly in phase. There's no phase lag. When you're right on omega naught, when omega equals omega naught, they're 90 degrees out of phase. That's when you get the really big amplitude. And then when you're really fast, they're out of phase. The drive is pushing and the response is happening at 180 degrees out of phase. So unlike the amplitude resonance, this one occurs really right on omega naught, not at some reduced, uh, reduced amplitude. It's hard to get a demonstration or a feel for, um, for the phase because it's just hard to show it. Right here, this really is a laser beam moving up and down very fast. Okay? Even if you could see it moving up and down very fast, it would still be hard to get an idea for the phase lag because it's moving down. You could kind of visualize the phase, but you have to compare it to the drive phase right, over here. Right? So you need to know this has a phase of zero. We use this to define when time equals zero. And you have to look at the response of that. And sure, I could put them on an oscilloscope, but that doesn't really tell you anything. If you really wanted to have an intuitive feel, we need to think of a way to get an intuitive feel for phase. So it seems like there's something in our childhood, something we've done that I have done. Let me think if I can come up with a way to see phase, to feel a phase lag on resonance. I don't know. It's a swing. We've all played with a swing when we were a child, and that's actually a way to remember the phase relation between the drive and the response. So I'm going to demonstrate it as soon as this kid gets out of the way here. And his dad was a little worried about the grown man uh, on the swing. So, OK, kid's out of the way. So when you um, did a swing, OK, let me fix my hair. Hold on. OK, here we go. When you do a swing, what you do when you learn to pump the swing yourself is you're basically leaning. Right? So if you just sit on a swing, you're a pendulum, and your center of mass rests under the pivot point. But by leaning forward and backwards, you're adjusting your center of mass in front of the pivot point or behind the pivot point, which creates a force forward and backwards. So also what you do to get a big amplitude is you lean and you put that driving force the, of your leaning right at about at the resonant frequency or the natural frequency of your own pendulum, of you on the swing. So now I want you to think back when you were really pumping the swing hard and when you were really hitting that biggest amplitude you could get. When you're really pushing is when you're changing your position. So watch me swing and think about it. And when you really change your position, it wasn't at the top of the motion, and it wasn't at the bottom of the motion. It's when you were really going into the top. So let's watch here. As I'm going into the top of the forward swing, before I get there, I start leaning. And then I get to the top. That's the response dragging or lagging the driving force. And at the back, I'm leaning now before I get to the top, and then I get to the top. See, there's, it's not quite pi over 2, but there is a phase lag between uh, the drive and the response. And then, of course, here's an Olympic dismount for you. There we go. Yes, that was at the swing. We have all experienced the phase lag on resonance before. Um, so what we've learned here, though, is that at steady state, omega as and ds all take definite values. I'll say defined values. So this is different from the free oscillator. The free oscillator, we had a case where omega, the frequency ended up depending on the spring constant and the mass. But a and, and phi, the phase, were free to vary. They, depend on the, they depended on the initial conditions. Now they don't. Now they're defined by the system. Well, 
when we uh, do our differential equation and we write it out and we make a guess, there's a rule that you have to have free parameters. You have to have free parameters, like for if it's a second order differential equation, if you have a second derivative, you have to have two free parameters. So the free motion, it worked out. We had the amplitude and the phase. Now, we have no free parameters. Everything here is defined in terms of things we've been given. The frequency we've been given, the damping we've been given, the force, the mass, the K, and the M, it's all been given. We have nothing free. So that's what tells us that this solution is incomplete. This is not the entire solution. We have to come up with more to get the entire solution. And your hint of where it's coming from is remember, this is just the steady state, the transient. We have to solve the transient to figure out the full solution that will have free parameters in it. You can see when we're off resonance a little bit, it has to go through this bobbing transient right, to get to the steady state. And then even once it reaches the steady state, if I mess with it and give it a new set of initial conditions, it's got to go through the transient again. So it's the transient solution that has the free parameters that go with the initial conditions, and that's what we'll figure out next.